this video, we'll learn how to play the board game Imperial. In Imperial, two to six players will take control of six Imperial nations, Austria-Hungary, Italy, France, Great Britain, the German Empire, and Russia. Each player represents an international investor, only the one who succeeds in increasing their capital and gaining influence in the most powerful nations will win the imperial competition. In other words, whoever has the most victory points at the end of the game wins. At the beginning of the game and throughout the course of the game, players will be owning bonds and improving their position in ownership of the different nations. Only the player who has the majority of ownership in any nation will actually make the moves for that nation on each turn. During the course of the game, each nation will be increasing its treasury by taxation. Each time a country taxes, it will move up on the power track. Once a nation has reached 25 power points on that track, the game immediately ends. At that point, players' final scores will be tabulated. The final score is the interest of all your bonds plus any cash you have on hand. So, even though players will spend most of their time operating the different countries, either building units, moving those units, or attacking other nations, all of this needs to be done with a view towards having the most individual wealth at the end of the game. With that in mind, it is important to note that each player's individual assets are kept separate from any of the treasuries of the countries which they control. I've made a separate video in this series about how to set up Imperial so I won't do that again here. Look for the link in the description below. Once the game is set up, no matter the player count, each player should have control of at least one country. The turn marker is given to the player who controls Austria-Hungary at the beginning of the game. After that, play will continue clockwise in order of the nations along the edge of the game board. The player sitting to the left of the Austria-Hungary player starts the game with the investor card. The investor card will be explained later in this video. Before we go through each of the actions available to players each turn, let's take a look at the board for more information that may be helpful. Each nation consists of five home provinces with one city in each. One factory can be built in each of these provinces. Shipyards build ships. Armament facilities build cannons. There are 15 brown land regions located outside of the home provinces of each of the countries. Only armies are allowed to enter these spaces. Only fleets are allowed to enter the Blue Sea regions on the map. The tax chart is used to keep track of the tax revenue of the nations. The scoring track shows the current power points for each of the six nations. Above it is shown a power factor. This factor will be used as a multiplier for endgame scoring when it comes to valuing each player's bonds. Finally, the rondelle is where players will choose actions that make up their turns each round. In each round, starting with Austria-Hungary, every nation will get to choose one space on the rondelle and take that action. On the first turn of the game, the game piece can be placed on any space of the rondelle and that action taken. After the first round, actions will be chosen by moving the game piece clockwise around the rondelle up to three spaces for free. Each additional space beyond that will cost the player who controls the nation $2 million per space paid to the bank. Keep in mind that this $2 million per space comes out of the player's personal wealth, not out of the treasury of the nation. On any given turn, the maximum move on the rondelle is six spaces total. The marker must be moved at least one space and cannot remain in place. Now let's look at each of the spaces on the rondelle in greater depth. When choosing factory, the nation will be allowed to build one new factory. Only one factory may be built in each city. Each factory costs $5 million, and the $5 million is paid from the nation's treasury to the bank. Now let's talk about production. When the produce action is chosen, each of the factories in the country will produce a unit. The brown factories will produce cannons and the blue factories will produce ships. The new armies and fleets are placed on the game board in the province where the factory is located. 
If a factory has hostile units present in its space, it may not produce. Nations may only produce in factories they own. They cannot produce in factories owned by other nations, even if they occupy them with hostile forces. Now let's talk about importing. When doing the import action, a nation may buy up to three military units for $1 million each from the bank. The units can be placed in any home province that does not have a hostile army present. Fleets have to be placed into the blue seaports. Deploying several military units in the same province is allowed. The maneuvering action is conducted in three steps. First, fleets are moved, then armies, and finally, any flags are placed into newly occupied regions. Fleets are allowed to move from one sea region to an adjacent sea region. After their production or import, fleets will always lie in a harbor. Consequently, their first move is always to the sea region that is adjacent to that harbor. Once fleets are at sea, they cannot return to land. Armies, represented by cannons, are allowed to move from one land region to an adjacent land region, except for Switzerland. Alternatively, they can be transported overseas via their own fleet in a convoy. It's important to note that each fleet may only transport one army per turn. A sea transport is only possible if the army is in a land region that is adjacent to a sea region. Here's an example of how a convoy might work. As part of its maneuver action, France would like to get its army in Paris into Dublin. So first, it moves its fleet from Brest into the English Channel and its other fleet in Bay of Biscay into the North Atlantic. Because neither of these fleets has already transported an army this turn, France can now move the army across those two fleets into Dublin. One of the cool features about army movement is that within a country's own borders, movement is free. Let's look at what I mean by this. If Italy wants to move its unit from Rome into Marseille using one maneuver action, it can do so. The way to think about it is, the unit is really moving from Genoa into Marseille, but it can get from Rome to Genoa freely because they're within the border of Italy. If, however, a hostile unit was present in Genoa, Italy would not be able to make the move into Marseille because hostile units prevent the free movement within a nation's borders. If instead Italy had wanted to move a unit from Marseille back to Rome, similar movement principles would apply. The move is really from Marseille into Genoa and then a free move from Genoa back to Rome because Italy can move freely within its borders. If any hostile units had been present in between, the movement would be blocked. Whenever a fleet or an army moves into a region in which units of another nation are present, it may turn into a battle if at least one of the sides wants it. In a battle, casualties are matched one-to-one -one and removed from the game board. Let's look at an example. Purple moves in and doesn't want to fight. It asks yellow first if yellow wants to fight, and yellow declines. Then purple asks green, and green elects to battle. Both the green unit and the purple unit are removed from the board. If green had also declined, then all three units can remain in the space peacefully. In a future turn, any one of these nations could use a maneuver action to initiate a battle in the same space, but for now, they would remain there peacefully. The same principle applies to armies. The active army moving into a space declares if it is hostile or friendly. Then the opponents decide whether they are hostile or friendly, and so on. During a maneuver action, if a nation has three of its units in the same space of an opponent's factory, they can elect to destroy the factory. This can only happen if there are no defending armies left. Additionally, if this is the nation's last factory, it cannot be destroyed. During the maneuver action, after all units have been moved and any battles fought, the active nation's flag is placed in newly occupied land or sea regions that don't contain foreign military units. Home provinces of foreign nations cannot be assigned flags. 
a flag will remain in a region until the region is occupied exclusively by another nation. As the result of a battle, it may happen that an inactive nation winds up occupying the region exclusively. In this case, the previous flag is removed and replaced by a flag of that nation. Let's look at the investor action. The investor action is conducted in three steps. Paying out interest, activating the investor, and investing as the Swiss bank. If the marker on the rondelle lands on the investor space, all three steps are conducted. If, however, the marker passes through the investor space on the way to another space, then only two steps are conducted, numbers two and three. If this occurs, the investor portion is not conducted until after the space landed on is completed. So, if a nation's marker passes through the investor space and lands on a maneuver action, the maneuver action is conducted first, and when that is complete, steps two and three of the investor action are completed. Now let's look at the steps of the investor action in greater detail. If the marker lands directly on the investor space, the first step of the investor action is carried out, and that is paying out interest. At this time, each player who has a bond of the active nation will get interest paid by the treasury of that nation. The interest amount is located on the bond. Payout begins with the player who has the least amount of interest in the active nation and works its way up to the player with the most. The player controlling the active nation always takes their interest last. It's important to note that if the treasury does not have enough money to cover all of the interest on its bonds, the player who controls the country has to make those payments out of his or her own wealth. Whether the marker landed directly on the investor space or simply passed through it on the way to another landing spot on the rondelle, once the landing spot's action has been completed, then steps two and three of the investor action are completed. In step two, the investor is activated. If you recall, at the beginning of the game, the player to the left of the start player received the investor card. Now it's time to activate that card. The player who holds the investor card now gets paid $2 million from the bank and then may invest in any nation from its available bonds. The investor may choose a new bond or increase an existing bond of the same nation that the investor already owns. In that case, the investor trades in the bond she already owns and takes the new bond from the nation's repository, paying only the difference. Whether purchasing a new bond or trading up, all payments are made into the nation's treasury and not the bank. Step three of the investor turn only takes place if any player has a Swiss bank marker. If a player does not control any government, he or she gets a Swiss bank instead. Ownership of the Swiss bank continues as long as the player does not control a nation. If she takes over a government again, she has to return the Swiss bank. The owner of a Swiss bank may force other nations on the rondelle to not pass over the investor spot, but land on it instead. This can only be done if the treasury of that nation will have sufficient money to pay out all interest on its bonds. In other words, this cannot be done to force the controlling player of that nation to pay money out of his or her own wealth. Regardless of whether a Swiss bank owner forced a stop on the investor space directly or the investor space was passed through, each player who has a Swiss bank and does not hold the investor card at the same time is also allowed to invest once. The only difference is that the owner of a Swiss bank does not get $2 million from the bank like the holder of the investor card would. If several players have a Swiss bank, investing is done in the order of play, moving clockwise starting from the player currently with the investor card. At the end of the investor turn, a reassessment is made to see if there will be any changes to the ownership of any of the countries. Now, if any new player has the highest total sum of bonds of any nation, that player takes over the government of that nation and is given the nation card. A tie with the current holder of the nation card is not sufficient to wrest control of the country from that player. Once all steps of the investor action are complete, the investor card passes clockwise to the next player. The final space on the rondelle we need to talk about is taxation.
When taxation occurs, there will be three steps that are conducted. In the first step, tax revenue will be collected by the nation and placed in its treasury. If there's any bonus for the controller of that nation, it will be assessed at that time. The active nation will receive $2 million for every factory it has without a hostile unit present, and also it will receive $1 million per flag on the board. The first time a particular nation taxes during a game, its marker will be placed on the tax chart. When taxation is completed, it's recorded on the tax chart by means of the game piece. In future taxation turns, any increase or decrease will be marked on this chart. For any increase on the tax chart compared to the previous level, the controlling player is paid a success bonus from the bank. The bonus is one million for each additional space. If the taxes are constant or decreasing, no bonus is paid out. Let's say Italy is taxing for the first time this game. It has two unoccupied factories and three flags on the board. That means its total tax revenue is seven. Italy's controlling player gets a bonus of $2 million and places that in her personal wealth. Now Italy moves on to the second step of the taxation action, which is adding power points. Because Italy's tax revenue is seven, it gains two power points. The newly acquired power points are added to the previous point standing on the scoring track, in this case zero, at the bottom edge of the board. Remember, as soon as a nation has reached 25 power points, the game ends immediately. Once the power points are assigned, we can move on to the third step of the taxation action, which is collecting the money. Before the taxing nation can add any money to its treasury, it will first need to pay one million per ship and one million per cannon to the bank for maintenance. So in our example, assuming that Italy has three units on the board, it will have to subtract three million from the seven million of tax revenue it earned and four million will be placed into its treasury. And that's it for all of the actions available on the rondelle. Now let's talk about the end of the game and scoring. As stated earlier, once a nation reaches 25 power points, the game ends immediately. A player's final score is the interest of their bonds multiplied by the nation's power factors on the scoring track, plus any remaining cash on hand. So for example, if Italy finishes the game with 17 power points, that gives it a factor of three. That means its $12 million bond generates $15 million of interest. That's 5 million times 3. After adding up the values of all their bonds and their cash, each million dollars equals one victory point. The player with the most victory points wins the game. In case of a tie, the player who has the higher credit sum in the nation with the most power points wins. If there is still a tie, the credit sums in the nation with the second most power points are compared, and so on. Before finishing up, I'd like to go over a few more general rules. The contents of any nation's treasury is public knowledge, but players may keep their own personal cash secret from the other players. Players cannot trade bonds with each other or lend or give money away to one another. And now you should have a pretty good idea of how to play the board game Imperial. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please like it and subscribe to my channel for more board game content.